This is going to finish up 1 John, and we're going to be in chapter 5. So 1 John chapter 5, and verse 1 says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And every one that loveth him that beget, loveth him also that is begotten of him. So he says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. But there are unclean spirits that believe Jesus is the Christ. In Luke 4.41, they say, Thou art the Christ, the Son of God. So every <clears throat> unclean spirit in the Bible is a fundamentalist. And those unclean spirits want to convince everyone that he isn't the Christ because they can't get born of God. They're like those people you see today who know the truth, but their job is to get you to believe a lie. This is because... In everything, the truth sets you free. When you find out the truth and quit believing a lie, the chains just fall off of you, and that's why these unclean spirits, they want to get you to believe otherwise. Verse 1 now. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that beget loveth him also that is begotten of him. Who is begotten of him? The Lord Jesus Christ. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Father has many sons, but Jesus is the only begotten Son. Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with child of the Holy Ghost, and the Lord Jesus was fully God and fully man at the same time. He was born of God. It's amazing to think about that Jesus Christ, when he was a baby, was so perfect that if, if he cried, it was only because he was in some type of pain. He never even had a deceitful cry as a baby. He was God manifest in the flesh. Whenever Mary told him to take out the trash and clean his room and wash the dishes, he honored his mother and probably already had it done. Even though she was a sinner and he wasn't a sinner, he honored his mother. He fulfilled all righteousness because he's God manifested in the flesh. Now verse 2 in 1 John 5 says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. All the commandments in the Bible can be summed up in this verse. If you love God and love the brethren, then you'll keep the commandments. Romans 13, 8 says, Owe no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. If you fulfill the law by loving one another, you fulfill the law by loving one another because if you love your brother like you should, you're obviously not going to murder him. You're not going to touch his wife. You're not going to steal from him or lie to him. Someone said, never trust any man with your wife or your wallet. And most times that's true. But if every man loved God and loved his neighbor, then you could trust them with both of those things. 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. And if you look at Ecclesiastes twelve thirteen, Solomon says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So if you love God, you're going to try to please Him. 1 John three twenty two says, And whatsoever we ask, we receive of Him, because we keep His commandments, and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. Everything we face every day, we should ask, does this please God? Does what I'm doing show I love God? Does this show that I love someone else? 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. The fruit of a consistent love for God will be a holy life through keeping the commandments. Keeping the commandments shouldn't be grievous. The commands the Lord has laid out are only for our good. You know, it's for our good that God said, Thou shalt not commit adultery because you don't want nobody committing adultery with your wife. It's a good thing He said, Thou shalt not murder. You don't want nobody just coming to your house and killing you. You see, all these things are good things. All the, all the commands the Lord lays out in the Bible, not just the Ten Commandments. It's all the commandments. Paul lays out all kinds of commandments in the Pauline epistles. Now, 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory 
that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Every born-again believer in the body of Christ has overcome the world, the wicked one, and at the rapture will finally overcome the flesh once and for all. Because we've been born again now, on the inside, we're perfect. we got something in us that's perfect. But on the outside, we still have our same sinful flesh. Jesus says in John 3, 3, He says, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You have to be born again, or born of God, to have the victory. Titus Titus 3, 5 says, Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That regeneration is what happens when you're born again. Now verse 4 in 1 John 5, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? Jesus is true victory. Notice John said, And this is the victory that overcometh the world. And in 1 Corinthians, when Paul talks about the rapture and us getting new glorified bodies that will never die, he uses that word victory. In 1 Corinthians 15, 55 through 57, he says, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then another word, triumph. In 2 Corinthians, Corinthians 2.14, it says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the Savior of his knowledge by us in every place. Jesus is the victory that overcometh the world, and we only overcome because he's in us. We triumph only because he's in us. 1 John 4, 4, You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In the tribulation, for a man to overcome the world, he does it in the sense of rejecting the Antichrist, rejecting the mark of the beast. He does this by enduring to the end, the end of the time of Jacob's trouble, or until martyrdom. That's how he overcomes the world. And then John 16.33 says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we're going to have tribulation here in this world. Uh, Jesus said, Marvel not if the world hate you. You know that it hated me before it hated you. He said, If you were of the world, the world would love his own. But Jesus overcame the world. The world hated him. And if you're living for God, it's going to hate you. But when Jesus overcame, he resisted the flesh, the world, and the devil, and then he was killed. A tribulation saint will have to resist the Antichrist and flesh to a certain extent because he's not going to be able to take the mark. And if he doesn't do that, he won't be able to buy or sell. He's going to be on the run. But... Thank God we're not going to be going through the tribulation because the rapture. The church doesn't go through the tribulation. 1 John 5, 6, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. So the Spirit bears witness that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. And any spirit that doesn't bear witness to this is an evil spirit. When Jesus came, he came by a water birth, which is your first birth. When he was born of a woman, he came by blood, but this wasn't man's blood. It was the blood of God. Acts twenty twenty eight says God purchased us with his own blood. Jesus Christ didn't have to have a second birth. As I said before, he was perfect when he came out of the womb and perfect in eternity past. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The Bible says, who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. 2 Corinthians 5.21, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus Christ never sinned. 
Matthew 1.18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with the child of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus Christ was born of God when he was born the first time. When me and you are born, we are children of Adam. Adam who was fallen and had a sinful nature, so we have to be born again. And that's when we get the Holy Ghost. But Jesus already had the Holy Ghost. There was never a time when Jesus had to have it. He wasn't born with the sin nature. So therefore, he didn't have to be born again. He was born perfect the first time. 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And this is the best verse in the Bible on the Godhead. So it's no surprise that the modern versions always tamper with this verse. But this is the Godhead here, also known as the Trinity. And much fighting is done over this topic, which can be a bit silly because our teeny tiny minds as humans will never be able to comprehend the Godhead. And I don't like to go too deep into it because my mind just can't grasp it. But what we do know is that the Father is God, the Word is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. And these three are one. They are all the same, yet different. And you can't explain it when you try to explain it you just make more of a mess of it just say they are all they're three but they're one they're all god and they're all equal none are lesser than the other none is greater than the other it isn't three gods but they are one and there are little illustrations you can use but even those can explain it perfectly now verse 8 and there are three that bear witness in earth the spirit and the water and the blood and these three agree in one. While the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost are one, in verse 8 it shows you the human side of things and says the Spirit, water, and the blood. And these three aren't one, like the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, but these three agree in one. 1 John 5, 9, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. The verse talks about witnesses, and the witnesses concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ numbered above 500 people. They witnessed it. In 1 Corinthians 15, 5, it says, And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. So 500, over 500 people seen Jesus after his resurrection. The witness of God, however, is greater than this because the gospel recorded in the word of God is greater than any witness of man, no matter how many men there are. The Bible itself is more sure than if all the disciples and all those 500 witnesses came back and told you that Jesus is God. The Bible is an even greater witness than that. 1 John 5.10, He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. It says, He that believeth not, God hath made him a liar. If you have believed on Jesus Christ, then you have the witness in yourself, and that is the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30 tells us about how we're sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. 1 John 5.10 Let's read it again. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Every Bible denier is a liar, because he rejects the record that God gave of his Son. And God will make a liar out of anyone who goes against his word. That includes atheists, Bible correctors, the modern versions of the Bible. The devil himself is called a liar. All men are called liars in the Bible because we have all gone against God at one point or another. The Bible says, Let God be true, but every man a liar. 1 John 5.11 says, And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And then John 14.6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. So Jesus is the life. 
People are always saying, I'm going to live life to the fullest, or you only live once, or get a life, or this is my life. True life is only found in Jesus Christ, and anything outside of Him is just vanity. It's just nonsense. It doesn't even matter. But this is the record that God gave in, God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. We have eternal life if you're saved. If you have eternal life today, and you could lose it tomorrow, then it was never eternal. 1 John 5, 12. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. All of these God-rejecting celebrities that think they're living the life are just walking dead men. They don't have life if they aren't saved. The Bible says in John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. All these big shot people out here who are just denying the Lord Jesus Christ are prospering because they're wicked. And the devil's giving them what they have. The Lord's allowing them to have what they have. But the one thing they don't have is life if they're rejecting the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 5, 13, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You can know that you have eternal life. You can know that you're saved. Many people say, well, I won't know until I'm dead. But that's a dangerous way to live because eternity is too long to not be sure of where you're going when you die. People lack assurance of salvation because many times a preacher talks them out of their salvation. People lack assurance because they have a preacher that doesn't even know if he saved himself. He doesn't have assurance. People lack assurance because they don't read the Bible. People lack assurance because they don't try to have fellowship with the Lord after they get saved. But John has written these things that you may know that you have eternal life. So how do you know? You know if you have believed. That is the only requirement to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross to pay for your sins. 1 John 5.14, and this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And then James 4.3, ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. If you pray a prayer or make a request to God out of a pure heart with the right motive and live a clean life, then your prayers will get answered. Don't pray about things to fulfill your lusts. Remember, what Solomon did, how he prayed for wisdom. He didn't pray for riches, and God blessed him. Praying for things like your favorite team to win an NBA Finals probably isn't according to his will. Praying for money and fame and fortune obviously isn't according to his will. 1 John 5.15, and, and, and if we know that he hear us, Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And a petition is a request. 1 John 5, 16, If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. And this shows the correct attitude you should have to a brother who is in sin. Pray for him. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. But there is also a sin unto death. For us to get practical out of application out of this for today, a sin unto death could be any sin a person does until it kills them. Even a Christian can sin until it kills him. Romans 8.13 says, For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. A lost person can commit a certain sin until that very sin kills them. The sin of driving too fast, for example. That's something you don't hear someone speak against much, but it's a sin to drive fast, drive way too fast. I mean, you're putting, you're risking killing yourself, your family, and someone else's family. Driving too fast and reckless puts everyone around you in danger. Obviously, I'm not talking about five going five over the speed limit and things like that. What I'm talking about is people going 
90 and a 50, 100 and a 70, and just reckless driving, putting everyone around you in danger. You may think it's a game, but there are families missing their kids because of a reckless driver. Just because you want to thrill, you drive way too fast and risk killing someone else's daughter or son or father or mother. The flesh loves a thrill. It likes to be a bit scared. It likes an adrenaline rush. And that's why people do these things. And some people do things like eat themselves to an early grave. They're living for the flesh, living for fulfilling that is their appetite. Some people smoke cigarettes till it kills them or stay in bitterness till it kills them. Christians do these things. There are sins unto death. The sin unto death also proves every Christian will not show a changed life. If every Christian had a changed life in how he lived in the flesh, then there would be no sin unto death. But I think primarily, doctrinally, the sin unto death refers to the mark of the beast in the time of Jacob's trouble because, let's read it again. Verse 16, If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death, I do not say that he shall pray for it. I believe the sin unto death is primarily the mark of the beast, which isn't possible for us to receive. We will already be gone in a rapture before it's implemented, but this is the only sin that wouldn't do any good to pray for because if a man takes it, then he's automatically going to hell. That's the sin unto death. Once you take it, there's no need in your brother praying for you because you're gone. You're done. Revelation fourteen eleven, And the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Today there is no sin that we shouldn't pray for someone to be delivered from because there is no unpardonable sin today. There is no mark of the beast type sin going on. The Bible says in 1 John five seventeen, All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So this is the definition of sin, all unrighteousness. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the whole world. Those people who were given up to a reprobate mind in Romans 1 are said to be filled with all unrighteousness. This verse says all unrighteousness is sin. If a reprobate or sodomite or pedophile couldn't be saved, then Jesus didn't die for those sins, but he did die for those sins. Just because someone had been given over doesn't mean they couldn't be saved down the road. Uh, Israel as a nation has been rejected, but yet they'll be restored. So anyone can be saved. The opportunity is there for anybody, as long as they're breathing, to be saved. 1 John 5.18 says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. So here remember the two natures of a saved man. One part of you is sinlessly perfect. The part of you that is saved is as righteous as Jesus Christ, but your flesh is crooked as it's ever been. And your flesh isn't born of God. Your flesh has to be changed at the rapture. You have been redeemed but your flesh hasn't been redeemed. This is why John says we know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. The new man inside of you doesn't sin. It is your old man, the flesh, that sins when you don't yield to the Holy Spirit. Your old man isn't born again. We're waiting for the redemption of our body. Romans 8.23 And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. 1 John 5.18 We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not what's born again, the new man, not your flesh. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. The wicked one, that is, the devil, can't touch my soul. I'm sealed unto the day of redemption. I can't sell my soul to the devil like the rockers and the rappers and the Hollywood actors. But even if you have sold your soul, that doesn't mean you can't get it back. But the devil can't touch my soul. However, he can touch my flesh. 
He can get my flesh if I live for the flesh. I can be turned over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. See, with these verses, you got to remember the two natures. You have two natures as a believer. One part of you is perfect because you got the righteousness of Jesus Christ. The other part is wicked because you still got the flesh. 1 John 5, 19, And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And this is why it is a danger for a Christian to conform to the world. Romans 12, 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. 1 John two fifteen, And love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The whole world lieth in wickedness because of the fall of man, because the devil and devil's influence on men, and because the devil's the god of this world. The whole world lieth in wickedness. And it's not all just the devil that makes the world wicked. In the millennial reign, man will still sin without unclean spirits present. And with the devil chained in the bottomless pit, man still finds a way to sin it's not till eternity that that sin is done away with Zechariah 13 2 says and it shall come to pass in that day saith the Lord of hosts that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land and they shall no more be remembered and also I will cause the prophets and the unclean spirit to pass out of the land and that's in the millennium you're going to have the unclean spirit to pass out of the land Yet there will still be sin present. And there will still be an army that gets gathered together when the devil is loose from the bottomless pit to go against Jesus Christ. First John 5.20 We know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. So true understanding only comes from knowing the Son. If you don't know the Son then you won't be able to discern spiritual things, as 1 Corinthians 2.14 talks about. But there are lost men who are geniuses, but they never come to the knowledge of the truth. 2 Timothy 3.7, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Corinthians 2.14, but the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 John 5.20 And we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true and we are in Him that is true even in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Notice it says this is the true God. That is the deity of Jesus Christ. In, uh, in Titus 2.13 Paul says looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is from the beginning. He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. Just on every, in every chapter, you're just finding the deity of Christ somewhere, it seems like. But then John closes it out here, and verse 21 says, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. Now, 1 Thessalonians 1, nine, Paul says the same thing. For they themselves show of us what mannering... What manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. You're either serving an idol or you're serving Jesus Christ. You need to get rid of your idols, get rid of all of the wicked stuff in your life, and focus on your fellowship with Jesus Christ. But this has been 1 John chapter 5 and this completes the book of 1 John.